Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today, Henry Dovey and Alvin Fritz. They're both experts in the field. Uh, Henry is more political than Alvin is, but uh, that doesn't take away from, from his uh, knowledge about this. He, he was one of the main uh, initiators of this project back in the days, and of course he was smart enough to get Alvin involved. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a long process, but we're getting close to home now. So uh, I don't know who wants to speak first, but I will invite both of them up to speak. <laughs> Give him a warm welcome, please. Well, thanks for so much, uh, Knut, for that uh, kind introduction and for clarifying that uh, I'm still a normal guy even though I was a politician for a period of time. Um, but uh, it's, it's always kind of there and I love these arenas and it's good to be, it's good to be here. Uh, we're here with uh, Link, Link Pathway, Alvin and myself, Alvin Fritz. We've been part of this project right from the beginning. Uh, the original was standing on the side of an irrigation bank and thought, you know, is this possible? We had done together with the county a integrated development strategy and it identified the possibility of a linear wetland or with a, with a bike lane or bike path alongside of it. So uh, then conversation started uh, with the SMRID and with, uh, with other municipal uh, entities and uh, I see uh, Terrence Lazarus is with us today. He was the chairman or the president, uh, CEO, uh, uh, manager of the SMRD at the time, and they were instrumental in allowing the link pathway to use uh, the bank of uh, this south lateral drain, which which makes this whole thing possible. And so we are eternally grateful to them for uh, seeing the vision and for allowing this to happen. It uh, definitely was a mindset change for irrigation districts to to allow things of uh, public nature to to invite the public on their canal banks. Even though people use them, it was always without authority. Once you invite them on, it changes things. So uh, so that, was, that part was really good. <clears throat> uh, we're also here today as, uh, you know, uh, being able to be part of this new, whole new active transportation uh, trend or uh, just everyone's more aware of their health and well-being. And so this uh, link pathway fits perfectly into, into that process where we, there's, there's just more opportunity for people to use uh, uh, walking, riding, uh, rollerblade, whatever it is on, on a pathway that, that would connect uh, and link Lethbridge to, to Coldell. And Albert will talk more about that. And then there's also the benefits of, uh, you know, biophilia, where you, where you get outside and uh, you just enjoy the nature, enjoy the surroundings and the calming effect that has on, on people. Uh, it's also an amazing uh, uh, help for health and for wellness and for well-being. So we'll take questions after this, and, uh, but at not this point I'll turn it over to Alvin and he'll talk about the pathway and the origin and the alignment that, that is there. And uh, so, th and thank you all for coming and for, for the interest. We're uh, we're very excited for the project to be where we are today, and uh, uh, we'll talk about some of the funding challenges and the funding windfalls that we've had over the past uh, couple of years. So, uh, so Alvin, uh, introduce you with that. And uh, thank you so much, Henry, and thank you, Knut, for those really kind words. Um, I was wondering where to start, but I see our video has popped up, so I may as well start there. Um, <clears throat> it um, actually is going to take us from the uh, 512 back, to, or just before the 512 back to the underpass of the 512. So that was kind of one of the main uh, challenges. And while I'm showing you the video, I'd like to tell you about biophilia, which is a really interesting concept. 
So this is a leg of the pathway. We've been animating it as we go, and of course we've landscaped it a little bit as well, just to keep it interesting at the picnic tables, the sitting areas. Um, but we're about to come up uh, from the south towards the north to the 512. You can see the highway activity on the 512. And uh, a bit of a, a god wink, we got a couple of culverts that uh, Henry had found <coughs> that are perfect to uh, create an underpass similar to the Van Tegum underpass to get underneath the highway. And of course, that's the safest way to cross any highway. So we're very excited by that, that that will become a reality. And, um, you know, this whole concept of getting out into nature actually has a physical uh, reaction on our bodies. It's a lot of people are not really aware, but when you've got your hands in the plants and you're, 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 you're looking at the outdoors, there's an endocrinal secretion change in your body. Anything that affects your blood chemistry through the uh, hypothalamus, so the pancreas, right? Uh, all of that suddenly, uh, either thyroid, your, your, blood, your blood chemistry changes just by being outdoors. We have a woman at a, I, I sit on the board of a senior center in Medicine Hat, and we have a, a gal named Eileen Moser, and she was cutting her wrist, she was uh, depressed, and um, <clears throat> it was very interesting that uh, uh, we gave her an assignment, almost uh, you know, like the Garden of Eden before the fall. Here she's got to look after the plants, so she's getting annuals and perennials. She's active, and in three months she goes from, and I don't think it was dementia, I think she was overdrugged because she was depressed, uh, to um, <clears throat> being independent living, recognizes the grandkids again, off her meds, no longer cutting her wrists, and I'm thinking, wow, that really works. We could have that kind of miracle. So to me, bike paths speak that and uh, it's just just amazing so I'm going to now go to my PowerPoint presentation for you <clears throat> and so um, if you were a walker a jogger a cyclist or simply someone who loves nothing more than getting outside in the beauty of nature maybe you want to improve your endocrinal secretions the link pathway is for everyone it's a natural recreational corridor the Link Pathway will offer a natural re recreational corridor for people of all ages and abilities. The Stunning Pathway will span the 15 kilometers linking the city of Lethbridge with the town of Coaldale. New Plan Pathway makes it possible for you to walk, bike, or rollerblade between these two urban communities along the SMRID Irrigation Canal, enjoying the rural landscape in between. Trail users will find facilities such as benches, interpretive signs, picnic shelters along the way, a safe alternative to riding or walking along the highways in the county. You know, even some of the best pathways right now are still being produced on the road edge, right? And our beauty is that we are gonna follow the drain swale, the south lateral of the St. Mary's River Irrigation District, which is actually, it does a little bit of delivery, but not a lot, mostly it's a drainage swale, but just a beautiful opportunity to uh, actually be riding along a water channel instead of along a road like isn't that an amazing thing so the black line that you see there is in fact uh, the pathway alignment we're planning to go just as the crow flies but ran into a few uh, negotiation issues so we end up having to jog it a little bit uh, past the jail lake and then come out just about the Tim Hortons and then into the Lethbridge system and of course, you want to have an anchor point. So one of our anchor points is Henderson Lake. What well, can be better than that? The other is uh, birds of prey. <laughs> and so we thought if we have two major anchor points, it will have a destination on each end, become very exciting. And so um, I'd like to begin by walking you through the first anchor point, the birds of prey. You're probably very familiar with it. It's in Coaldale. Um, there's its address right there. <clears throat> on 16th Ave, just a little bit north and central. You can find it, uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's incredible. I know when we first started showing the pelicans that are out there, people said, those aren't there. Yes, they are, they are. You can go find beautiful pelicans and uh, explore the wetlands. It's an international destination in its own right, and Colin Weir, the visionary founder, is just incredibly on top of it all the time. It started out as a uh, wetland and stormwater retention pond and then recognized opportunity and became birds of prey and I think it was just a way for Colin to leverage the opportunity of really creating something special. 
So Coaldale has been very good and they've built the first leg and we have a little pond there. It's actually meant for firefighting, but uh, I was making presentations through the IDS and Henry was there with me, we're recognizing opportunity. Why don't we shape them a little bit rather than these rectangular little ponds, you know, make them into something. And sure enough, we have it there and the landscaping's there and there we are in front of it. And actually behind it, uh, the speaker is a waterfall over here. And they actually built it just the way we had modeled it. It's just incredible. Uh, a town of Coldale given us a check of $100,000 in June, uh, and they had actually also built this first lake. I'll show you a video of our animation of that, and the waterfall is every bit as beautiful as we can animate it. Uh, all the way back to the Alkwater River Dairy, which is in the southeast corner of town, and uh, Brian Stoudestyke has some vision there for a dairy barn, an eco-dairy, uh, very cool kind of concepts that suddenly make it a little bit more uh, urbanized and available. So then we get the, the underpass, which I just showed you the video of, so we're excited for that. <clears throat> And safety is the number one thing. You can get lights, you can get yellow, amber flashing lights, and they're just killing machines, right? Uh, uh, a full stop, and especially on that highway, not good. So an underpass is really the way to go. Uh, if you go to Father Leonard and Van Tegum, you can see what that looks like, and uh, it'll be a beautiful thing. And Henry's driving by Fort McLeod, sees a couple of box culverts. The next thing we know, we got a broker for our, our underpass. How beautiful is that? <clears throat> and then, that then is the emerging Easter leg, and I've got a video of that I'll show you as well. And then, you know, all along the way, we want to have interpretive places where people can discover what irrigation is all about, uh, rest stops for a picnic. Um, uh, there will be all, all kinds of uh, opportunity to have wetlands that will encourage uh, the birds, the fauna, things for people to explore and discover. And this is back at the the Coldale Pond, where we had the sod turning. All right. Um, there's going to be bridges across the canal from time to time, which just add interest and uh, provide for safe canal crossings, which is another aspect of safety that we know St. Mary's will appreciate. And then finally, the other destination is Henderson Lake. And of course, Henderson Lake is already tied into the Lethbridge network, which is very advanced, as is Coaldale's. Both Coaldale and Lethbridge have really good bike path systems. And so it's uh, wonderful just to connect into that. It's also the third largest uh, river valley park in Canada. So it's got all kinds of potential just to expand beyond what it is all the way to uh, the uh, Old Man River and the Indian Battle Park. Um, but in the meantime, Henderson Lake has already got some uh, a well-developed and established path network. It's got a golf course there, uh, which can be considered part of the destination the Henderson Pool and Recreation Area, and of course the Nikayuko Japanese Gardens. Uh, we just received a check in February 10th from uh, MLE Grant Hunter for a million dollars. So, <laughs> yeah, wonderful, eh? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and here is your a uh, hard-working board that ensures the success of the endeavor. Of course, we've got Knut there immediately on our right, Henry standing in the back. So, yeah, and with that, that ends my presentation, except for I'd like to take you to our second video because we just love those videos. <clears throat> so this one here is um, f the Elk Dairy Farm would immediately on our right, and we're now running behind uh, Green, what do you call your neighborhood? Uh, your street green Ever evergreen Estate. evergreen estates um, and um, you know at, at peak this canal will look every bit this beautiful uh, the landscaping's there it's just not quite yet matured but you're going to come across that uh, beautiful waterfall that uh, that Tanika uh, put into our renderings and um, uh, you know, it looks like the finger of God having touched the, the, the canal, but when we were there for opening day, St. Mary's had just activated it, and it looks every bit as beautiful as what we present here. And uh, so we're now following along the west edge of Coaldale, in behind uh, Evergreen Estates, and uh, coming up to the waterfall, and there it is in all its glory. We're gonna be able to have a little interpretive area right there. And uh, it looks every bit that good. 
And then the trees, of course, have to mature a little bit yet, but there's the new pond, which is no longer a rectangular mass, just a, a, a gorgeous. So we're grateful to Coaldale for having embraced the vision and having built that pond the way ponds should be built. And uh, it uh, really works. So grateful for that. <clears throat> and uh, of course, uh, my staff can't resist to do a little bit of atmospheric lighting and have the sunset and all of that. So I think we get a little stretch of that here as well, which is always so amazing. <clears throat> we want to make the rest areas really inviting so that people actually have multiple destinations along the length. Uh, you might not have time to get all the way to Henderson Lake from Coldale or vice versa. And so, uh, that's, uh, this is actually now the exact location of the sod turning. Uh, actually, sorry, I was on the north end of the, of the pond. And there you go. It's just amazing. I, I think that makes it fun for them if they can have the sunset. <coughs> And, you know, so often from other parts of the world, people will want to come. I know uh, Japanese and German tourists come just to see the open space. You know, it's just, oh my goodness, it's beautiful. All right. And with that, I'm just going to go back to the PowerPoint for the last slide. And that is um, um, how to contact us. If you've got a pen or you've got a way of uh, snapping a quick photograph, then just uh, snag Henry's... Uh, gmail.com, duvehenry at gmail.com. Thank you very, very much. Can we go back to the one way that uh, the path? <clears throat> well, that was uh, very good, uh, Alvin. They give it a good overview of the pathway. Just wanted to confirm or um, <clears throat> um, Explain it, a couple things on Alvin's presentation. At number six, seven, uh, we call it the 512 crossing. It, it's referred to as the jail road. I'm assuming most people know that, but it's the crossing of the jail road. And it's about four and a half miles east of 43rd Street is where we'll cross the, the 512 or the jail road. You'll see at number five, at the <coughs> sorry. At number two, and just between four and five, we do run alongside Highway 512 or the jail road at that point just to, um, uh, to facilitate the, the alignment and to facilitate the connection. But it's only for those small stretches, uh, and uh, that also will, will add an, uh, a good element there as well. But if you look at from f number four, from one through four, that area there, and uh, we do have to give a shout out to uh, Lethbridge East MLA and Nathan Newdorf on that. He really helped us with the piece from uh, three through four, because that crosses provincial uh, land. So that's the Alberta government that owns that. You'll see it's right behind where the where the, the jail is now. So just to add some context so you fully kind of understand. But also, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, the approved crossing or the uh, Approved uh, alignment through there from the province to uh, go through provincial lands. And again, that's something that just uh, takes a lot of work, takes a lot of legwork, takes a lot of people in the right places knowing how to navigate those, uh, those waters. And then from two, uh, it's actually from three till uh, one, or one through three, I guess, that crosses federal land. And that's the federal research station there. And it, just south of that, they have their 100-year-old plots that have been there for, you know, since I think they established. And they're very protective of those plots, and they didn't want us anywhere close to it. But they allowed us to go alongside, so we're right alongside the jail road there, which doesn't interfere with the plots. But be, we'll be able to have um, interpretive storyboards telling the story of the research station, how that fits, and how this historical research, these 100-year-old plots, and why they're so protective, and, and why that's uh, still so important today. And again, we never would have thought in 100 years that we would be able to get access to federal lands uh, to cross them like that. But, uh, you know, our coordinator, Peter Casciarella, is very, uh, he's, uh, he's very uh, professional in that field and knows uh, how to navigate those waters. And so eventually you start talking to the person that actually can make 
uh, these decisions. And in Ottawa, the Ottawa Research Station, they have a lot of bike paths that go through it and that connect to the town and to the city. And people come through there and they bike through it. And it's just, just an amazing thing. So they really saw the value in having it. But still, it, it creates these liability issues that we've had to, uh, to work our way through. And on the end, they've signed off. So that also is very exciting for us that we got access through federal lands and provincial lands. And it really shows that buy and it really shows that, uh, you know, when, when, when a, a community effort, you know, where uh, collaborative effort comes together, they see the value and they really work with us. We, you know, so that, that part has also been very exciting for us to see that happen. So uh, also I'd mentioned briefly in my opening address about active transportation and how we are part, how we add an element to active transportation in this region. Uh, Coldell has their own bike path, bike walking path network. City of Lethbridge has their own. So now with this link pathway, we called it link on purpose because at the time we wanted to link, we saw it as linking communities and, and who knows where this ends up, but right now we're linking Coldale uh, to Lethbridge uh, through Lethbridge County along SMRID, uh, Canal Bank uh, land. And so, you know, there's four linkages right there. So that part is pretty good or uh, very exciting also. But uh, how, how this fits into the active transportation strategy that most communities are adopting now uh, you could you could physically, uh, literally then, once this is completed, a commute on your bicycle from Coldale to Lethbridge. You could, uh, you, on a Saturday morning, you could load up with your family. You could ride to Coldale, have a, an enjoying uh, a donut at the Coldale Bakery, you know, some of the best donuts in southern Alberta. And... Uh, uh, enjoy that, and then come on your way, you know, back to Lethbridge. But I've done a lot of cycling in this region. I was just going to warn you. Ideally, you would start in Coldale and end up uh, uh, Lethbridge. Cold would be your homeward journey because even when it's not windy here, it's windy from the southwest. So you'll you'll get a tailwind if you're going back from Lethbridge to Coldale. <clears throat> So, and then one final thing I just wanted to mention, uh, Alvin talked lots about going through agricultural land. We can see the, the agricultural land. We have many uh, agriculture corporations now, uh, that input provider and seed companies that really like the idea of having these storyboards. So we can, we, in all these rest areas, there will be places where you can put interpretive storyboards. You can tell the story of irrigation. We can tell the story of canola, how all this fits into the fabric of, of the community of southern Alberta, what makes it successful, and um, why is the GDP in agriculture GDP in this part of the province as um, uh, on par with all the other agriculture producing areas of, of Alberta. And it's because of irrigation, and it's because of the high value crops. We won't see a lot of potatoes along this, this corridor piece. But potatoes also is a, is a big, uh, big component of it. Uh, we've received uh, a $200,000 gift from a Canes also to help tell their story, but also to help build the pathway. They see the value. It just, uh, you know, everyone sees the value of this and how this really, uh, you know, connects this community of Southern Alberta together. Uh, finally, uh, and we'll open for a question and answer. I, I believe Knut, we have time for question and answers. Um, there's a, we have a member of Lethbridge Tourism on our board. They see the value. Tourism sees the value of this pathway, how we can market this as a uh, uh, marketing uh, piece. You know, like uh, Alvin said, people from Germany and Japan and from other areas of the world come to areas just so they can cycle and they can be active and they can uh, really experience the region. Which uh, The best way to experience the region is on a bicycle. You're going slower, you can smell the grasses, you can smell the, the, the trees, and it's, uh, it's awesome. One final little anecdotal thing, and maybe it's more about the city of Lethbridge. Years ago, we had uh, someone staying with us for a period of time, came from the Netherlands. And I took her on a bike ride through, um, through the River Valley Trail, and we left uh, down below the, uh, the golf course, I think from, from Scenic Drive down to uh, the country club down there. And there's a point in there, you can't see anything. You can't see the city, you don't see any houses, you don't see anything. And she literally just said, can we just stop and just smell? 
Because in the Netherlands, they don't have that. So we just don't understand sometimes the, 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 the value of this region and, and of some of these things. But uh, so that, it was something I just didn't for, forget how it was just so real to her that she could be in the spot in the middle of a city and see no houses and see no infrastructure and just, just calm and quiet. So, so with that, uh, if it's all right, we open for questions and answers. And uh, we'll do our best to answer the questions. And uh, we thank you for your attention and for your interest in this pathway. <clears throat> LSCO is a big supporter of SACPA. They let us have this place for free. And, but of course they hope that you will purchase a meal while you're here. That's kind of what makes the world go around. Uh, I also like to thank the U of L. They have been supporting SACPA ever since day one for soon 57 years. Pretty amazing. They even give us a little bit of cash. I also like to thank uh, Lethbridge Herald, of course, for steadfast being here every pretty much every session, writing good stories, and. Uh, all of them, uh, sometimes are the media as well. And of course, Ryan from Rogers, he's, uh, he spread the word really well. SACPA is seen by thousands of people in Lathbits. So aside from the people who show up at the sessions, it gets around. Uh, please state your name when you come to ask a question and uh, keep it fairly short, topical. Uh, yeah, I mentioned the donation jars already, but thanks for reminding us again. Without further ado, let's get this questions going. If we have an eager person, and a well-read uh, person who would ask the first question. Uh, my name is Jim Tagg, and I do a lot of road cycling here, 3,000 kilometers on average every year for the last 15 years. So I'm fairly familiar with some of these roads. I'm very happy, though, to see a bike path, uh, especially in that area, which uh, needed it desperately, and it's going to be even nicer than I thought it would be. I just have a, a couple of questions. Uh, about the route. I, I see you go along the jail road. I take it you don't go on the jail road. I don't know many road cyclists anymore who ride the jail, jail road unless they have a death wish. And that goes from other places. But my question is more about um, the connection with the 7th Avenue bike uh, way, which um, terminates at the end of uh, at the east end of Henderson Lake. I mean, currently, to take this route, you go, you go to the end of the lake, you go all the way down to uh, South, South Parkside Drive, you go to 43rd Avenue, uh, and uh, 43rd Street, and you go north, uh, which I ride quite a bit. It's trashy uh, from uh, South Parkside Drive up to Tim Hortons, and it's really busy. So I'm wondering if there's any in, in envisioning any kind of a better connection. I know it's in, difficult because of the railroad, but I'm just wondering if there's any any idea about that connection. Thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Jim. Uh, just let me add a little bit of uh, context there. The city back in the day has agreed to help us with the connection, the interface between uh, the county and uh, the city. Uh, initially, our plan was to enter the city at 10th Avenue uh, or South Parkside Drive. Uh, that was our initial uh, idea before we went through public consultation and through trying to find the, the alignment, an approved alignment. <clears throat> the issue, there, so there's several issues with that. It's a good uh, interface to the city, but you have to cross the railroad track. Where we come in now, we don't have to deal with the railroad track, which <coughs> is better for us. 
uh, if you're going to get CP Rail on site, it's going to take a long time to get those conversations going, and it's, uh, it's, it's very expensive to cross. So the alignment where we come in now is a better alignment. It comes in at 6th Avenue, and I believe, Jim, your question has to do with where do you go once you enter a W2 Hill Park? There is a crossing at the exhibition. People use it. It's not. It's not really an official crossing, and it. it, it it's not really. Uh, it, it's not really endorsed. It, it's kind of <laughs> frowned upon. <clears throat> the city is currently working with CP Rail to have a uh, pedestrian crossing at. Highway 3 and 30th Street, I believe, is where it's going to be. So that'll bring it from W2 Hill, that'll bring it into, into the city. Uh, so um, uh, that's, uh, that's a connection. The idea is that we would just cross either at 6th Avenue or at 4th Avenue where Timmy Hortons is. 6th Avenue is where the new Tim Hortons is. So uh, I hope that adds some, some uh, understanding or some clarity and, um, to that piece. Uh, Alvin, uh, anything? Yeah, just the comment that, uh, you know, obviously we were able to negotiate all of the alignments, which <laughs> it took a lot harder than we thought, uh, through through the entire run, all the way from uh, Coaldale, uh, then obviously initially our plans were to carry right on through here, because the destination, Sanders Lake, but it became cumbersome, we kept running into roadblocks, which then drove it to there. But then we started the discussions with the city, and the city, once you're in city territory, have their own uh, mandate, but they've been working with CP Rail, and they're gonna take it through to Henderson Lake, as we understand it, and so they'll, they'll make sure the path is good, so that connection should. But I know exactly what you're talking about, because I've ridden that one on my bike often as well. My name is Mike McKeg. I have uh, two question really number one um, how much of this trail has been completed enough that we can ride on it today and where do you access it and number two uh, I'm 80 years old and I'd really like to ride that whole thing when might that happen <laughs> That million dollars from Grand Hunter has really helped us. So we are breaking ground this spring and pushing hard. Right now, that one piece that I showed you with the video, actually, Coaldale features it online. You can go find it there as well. It goes from Elk River Dairy Farm uh, along Coaldale around the back. But that's the only leg that's done so far. But we're starting construction this spring. That's why we broke the sod. And we're going to go to here for sure immediately. And then uh, as far as the cash goes, keep going. But a million dollars certainly helps a lot. So I believe we'll be done uh, so that you can ride it. In fact, we'd love to have you there for the uh, Virgin Vir Journey, the, the seminal journey. So we'll, we'll count on it. <laughs> Hi, gentlemen, Henning Mundell, and I actually have a couple of questions. First of all, we had read about and seen that it was supposed to start at Birds of Prey, but Birds of Prey is north of the highway, so I'm very confused with your map here because it shows it like as though it's south of the highway. Right. But beyond that, uh, I, I wondered to know, okay, you're planning all these rest stops. Does the rest stop mean also toilets? for people that are passing through and back. Thank you very much for the question, very good point. Our little arrow for Birds of Broy, south of the highway, not north. So there will be a grade level traffic light crossing at Boss Sod. So when you come into Coldale right now, you notice Boss Sod on the very left, it's got a little red bar in there, it's got goats, that, that will actually have a traffic light and a level crossing which would then allow you to get to Birds of Prey. Um, and then with regards to the washrooms, yes, it is. West Coast Yes. Okay, thank Yeah. Back and to the high school. yes. Uh, no, we will yeah. still be It'll east be of there, eh? Well, it's east, but uh, yeah. high school is right in that area. Mm -hmm. So the crossing will be right at the Peter Boss crossing. And then the washrooms are in the plans. Yeah, yeah we want to do, yeah. yeah. We, we haven't yet got uh, the precise locations pegged. We know what the architecture should look like, a very rustic, uh, uh, you know, ur urban architecture, and so we'll, we'll be doing that as well. We also have a community centre planned, but uh, it's still in the throes, so thank you.
Thanks for your presentation. I'm very interested in this trail. But I have another question. I'm part of the Fairfield Garden Society that plants flowers in the old picnic area. And we're just renewing our contract. And they want millions and millions of dollars of liability insurance just for us to stick plants in a flower bed. So I wonder how in the world you got liability insurance to run a trail. Henry, answer that one. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I didn't catch your name, but it's it's fine. The question is fair. Uh, liability is is is, a, is always a big thing, and that was one of the initial conversations that uh, the SRID had as well. And uh, we, as a, a committee, also had those concerns and questions and uh, Lethbridge County as well, because uh, they've endorsed it. Once this pathway is done, it will be under the, uh, basically Lethbridge County will run it and will operate it. They won't necessarily operate, we'll probably operate it, but it'll become part of their parks and uh, pathways network. So if you have Diamond City, you have uh, a certain involvement with Ready Made Community Hall, for example, McNally. Uh, so it'll fall under their uh, liability insurance. And we also have a certain amount of liability insurance anyways, as, as well as, as our committee, which uh, you know you, you need in today's thing. But at the time when the county was, and I was part of the conversation at that time, at the county level, we had a presentation from uh, the insurance lawyer uh, that deals with uh, co-insured and deals with liabilities and things. And there's it, the, the liability pathways is so low that like people really never activate normally, historically. Uh, they just enjoy using them and if they trip and they fall, that's not to say they can't try, but uh, it'll be under the Lethbridge County will be uh, looking after the liability and of the pathway. Bev Mundell Atherstone, thank you so much. That's quite exciting. Uh, I was hoping that it was already up and running with all the beautiful plants. Okay, I've got uh, a couple of questions. One is, um, what about if people decide that they're going to swim in the canals, or if someone falls in and drowns, uh, how are you going to deal with that? And the other is the square culverts um, in a in a terrific rainstorm, which we can only wish for, um, what happens if under the culverts floods and people can't get from one side to the other? Are you going to have drainage? And um, um, you've noticed you've I noticed that you have the benches for people to rest. What about shading for the vent benches with global warming and getting hotter and hotter? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for those questions. Um, with regards to um, the, the need for shade. We're going to try and plant the trees so that they appropriately shade, and uh, that'll work really well. Of course, deciduous trees will hold their leaves in the summer, and shade is desirable, and then in the shoulder season, they start to drop, which again cr creates interest. So I think uh, definitely part of the vision. Um, and then um, with regards to swimming in the canal, there's been the occasional instance, uh, last year you remember in the news, uh, an ATV had gone into the canal system, and so people are already illegally, as Henry pointed out earlier, dealing with it, and we don't know all of the details of that, but for that the uh, right-of-way and the insurance that's there would cover for that. Um, we certainly, it's interesting because I, I grew up swimming in the weir of the uh, east ladder, uh, south lateral, right? Uh, at the edge of cold and my cousins were there and it was so fun. I rode my bike there as a as a 10 year old and went swimming in the weir, which is probably not the safest thing in the world, but that's what we did as kids. So I'm not sure exactly how you keep people out of there if they're gonna decide to swim, but I think it'll be appropriately signed and, and mitigating risk to the people that do in fact uh, take a risk, right? And they have to understand you're doing this at your own risk, and um, it's it's not allowed, so to so to speak. So it'll be appropriately signed that please stay out of the canals. I'm sure St. Mary's does not want people swimming in their canals. Uh, notwithstanding, that was a lot of fun when I was little. <laughs> the culverts, you know, we were in the air in 2011 with the integrated. Uh, 
uh, strategy, the design strategy. Uh, and I don't know, Henry, were, were you, did you join us or was it just our consultant team maybe? But uh, there have been times in the 30 to 60 year events when it overwhelms the entire system. But part of the vision was that the St. Mary's drain swale would be managed effectively as part of an infrastructure to help uh, bleed the moisture off the area. You probably are aware of the um, the work that's been done in the vicinity of Coaldale, and uh, they actually are taking water all towards uh, the lake, uh, right? And so um, it's, it's uh, I believe, performing fairly effectively, and it's being engineered by MP Engineering, who's our, now our namesake for the name, and so uh, we're trusting that engineering, notwithstanding having been in a helicopter in 2011, I know that there'll be a day when you'll have that you know, incredible flood uh, after which you have to do some repairs. Hopefully they'll be minor because we've engineered well. I'm Pat Greenlee. Um, I understand that, th that this trail is now received um, designation as part of the Trans-Canada Trail, but uh, you didn't mention anything about that in your talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. You know, um, we just uh, last uh, week, late in the week, came up with a sign concept because uh, they have a specific sign mandate. And so I think it's because it's so fresh and new for us. But it's exciting to be part of the Trans-Canada Trail System. Wow. And to be acknowledged and honored in that way, it just has given us wind in our sails. So thank you very, very much for mentioning it. It's absolutely true. And right now we are putting together a sign package uh, for them to get their approval for it. Of course, they have to have their logo. They've got all their details of it. And I, I did renderings. I could have easily brought them uh, just as late as Friday last week. So thank you. Uh, Bev Trainer, I'm wondering what type of uh, restrictions might be placed on motorized uh, bicycles and scooters or that kind of thing. Thank you very much. This is a, a walking and hiking trail, so and bicycling trail, so no uh, motorized scooters and so forth. Of course, that'll be different uh, for those that people have for disabilities and so forth. But uh, it certainly is not meant for for motorcycles, for instance, and and anything more rambunctious than that. So, uh, hoping to sign that effectively and police it at some level. But I think that's the best we can do, uh, is just to encourage and nurture responsible behaviors on the path. If if, if I can just add to that, uh, just briefly, uh, you know, we're talking motorized vehicles like motorbikes. Uh, we would not and uh, advocate for having motorized bikes on it. But with electro bikes now, because that's motorized as well, and so uh, with electro bikes, uh, we're just not sure how to do it, but we're not gonna disallow them, but we're just hoping for respectful behavior, and we'll put speed limits on so people aren't going so fast, because those electro bikes, even those things, they're, they're pretty fast, and also would add an element of danger. So so it'll, it'll have to be through signage, and you know, uh, people just need to be responsible. They're dealing with it on city bike paths now, Oh, and so, so that's that's what the signs will be around. But we would we would not disallow electric bikes, but motorbikes probably not so much. We're trying to stay without the smoke and without the, the carbon. It's active transportation. Hi, Henning Mundel again. Um, two quick questions. One is partly sort of looking in the very long term with the. Uh, discussions ongoing with a shortage of water and reducing evaporation that more and more of our canals are to be pipes rather than open canals and uh, how that would fit into this concept. And the second is, uh, um, do you plan to have little leaflets around distributing to so that people know where they can go? Yes. Thank you very much. So um, on the one hand, uh, with regards to leaflets and so forth, I think signage will be the prevalent thing and we'll have trail markers. You are here and you can analyze the trail and look at a map wherever you are. And that works really good. And I apologize for the first part of your question. Just give me. About uh, pipe versus 
pipe, the pipe dream. Yes, St. Mary's has a pipe dream. All oh, irrigation sorry. districts have a pipe dream. And they do. And so uh, it's largely for their delivery system. So this particular uh, swale was a, a naturally occurring swale um, uh, in historic times. And uh, as such, it's not considered particularly a delivery uh, swale. It's, uh, it's a drainage swale. Even uh, the jail lake that you see uh, across from the research station is a stormwater retention lake. And so uh, it's a very, very tiny part of St. Mary's system, almost negligible. And because it's not part of the delivery, uh, I think, uh, you know, obviously, if it, if it were ever to get so bad that this little canal cannot run water, uh, you know, it'll just be a very nice little swale. But hopefully it never gets down to that. But that's a very, very tiny trickle, hardly measures in in any tangible way because it's not a, a delivery part of the St. Mary's River Irrigation District. Hi, yes, thanks for your presentation. My name is Frank Clarney. I just had a question about cycling in winter on this trail. Um, I know the city of Lethbridge clears a lot of trails in winter and you can still walk and cycle just fine. So I was just wondering about snow clearing. Is that an option or is there just um, too much trail or just do we just let the snow melt? Uh, thank you again for that question. We actually uh, ideally see this as a four season trail. So whatever the weather is, is what the trail is exposed to. Uh, that's not to say at some point uh, there might be some pressure on uh, the committee or on the uh, county to keep it clean. But it, it, it's, it's a difficult, it's a 15 kilometer path. And so for now it's a, it's a four season trail. So you can cross country ski on it, you can uh, snowshoe on it and you can wear your gum boots when it's raining. So, the true urban experience. R rural experience, sorry. My name is Terry Shillington, Shillington and thank you very much for uh, uh, quite a stimulating presentation. <clears throat> I want to re-ask the Moyer question about when will it be finished, because I didn't hear a clear answer to that. Does the million dollars complete it? Uh, or do you have a timeline about uh, how many millions you need to finish it? That's one question, <clears throat> just a, maybe a clear answer to that question. Secondly, it's probably premature, especially if it's not finished, but <clears throat> any thought about bike rentals? And uh, yeah, work with this, any entrepreneur that uh, would be interested in that? So thank you for those questions. Uh, so you're right, we didn't properly answer the, uh, the completion piece. So we have uh, broken this trail thing down into different phases. Phase one actually, which is from Coaldale up to uh, the jail road or the 512 crossing, is uh, the, the, the base work has started, but then we ran into snow and uh, rain conditions last fall. So it, it's actually started. We anticipate phase one to be completed uh, uh, by June, probably June or middle June of this year. And that's a four to four and a half kilometer piece starting in Coaldale up to the jail road. It'll be paved. We also didn't mention this path, the full 15 kilometers will be a paved pathway. It'll be three meters wide, so about 10 feet. Uh, the whole the whole length and uh, so so which is kind of the standard I believe that the city user standard uh, bike path uh, dimension and uh, the full trail completion uh, all things being equal should be done by uh, the fall of 2025 uh, again it depends on on, on funding sources and uh, uh, you know, we have some grants that we're awaiting word on yet and uh, so that's that's our goal is to have a complete by then and bike rentals, uh, you know, I can see there's uh, this is a pretty entrepreneurial part of the country here. There's going to be people will have uh, booths set up with the, where you can rent bikes. And that might be an agreement with, with that some of our rest stops where they'll park them and uh, there'll be some sort of agreement with us to use that space. But uh, the, the pathway committee doesn't envision managing that, but we see, we certainly expect some people to step up and uh, much like the, 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 it might even be the same company that has uh, electric bikes in, in the city of Lethbridge. 
so we only have to live for another year and a half to be on our inaugural journey, and uh, we'll have ribbons relative to age categories honoring you, so we'll be sure to get that right. Bless you. I just asked the moderator if I could ask a question. Uh, there's some exciting developments in terms of uh, picnic shelters and uh, possibly a place that families could rent to have a family gathering and stuff like that along the trail. So I wonder if our speakers could uh, talk a little bit about those ideas, uh, which uh, sounds pretty exciting to me. Yes, okay. It's a, it's a plan. It's, it's yes. You know, we are working, we actually even engaged the college students through a competition to do a uh, three season shelter, which we have plans for, and uh, also have some major interest in, also with the Lethbridge College. And so um, just waiting for the ideas to gel. And then again, there are opportunities for uh, investing and donating towards picnic uh, shelter, a uh, picnic. Uh, benches to, uh, and park benches and so forth. So all of that will be uh, gelled and, and uh, sorted out as we engineer and work through the architecture of the pathway as part with MPE. Does that answer fairly good, Knut? Is that good? Yeah? Okay. Bev Mendel Atherstone again. I'm just wondering if uh, someone should have an incident like a heart attack or something, or someone gets terribly hurt, there's a crash between a bike and a pedestrian, how would emergency services uh, reach the people on this, especially this long length of trail um, along the uh, swale? Thank you, Beth, for that question. It's also, it's, uh, it's been a consideration that we have uh, talked about, we've considered uh, the possibility. And the path is three meters wide, so it's certainly accessible for uh, emergency vehicles to access the path. And uh, there probably will be bollards that are easily adjusted to allow for vehicle traffic in, uh, in the unlikely or in the event that something uh, does happen on the path and that you need emergency vehicles on there. So so the path will be wide enough to accommodate emergency vehicles. And with, I think with GPS now, with most people have phones with them, I think locations would be identified through, through, uh, through the GPS location. I guess I was wondering if there would be access points uh, other than along the trail. Sure, so at every major intersection where we um, uh, have the 512 and then in Coaldale, near the elk uh, dairy farm uh, will be engineering with MPE, or MPE access points. Of course, they, they wouldn't be going through the underpass, so on each side of the underpass. Then again, uh, at every major township road crossing, uh, and then of course along uh, the jail road, the rest of it tends to follow the, the uh, road system. So really, as you're saying, it's this stretch, but we will have entry points, and then it is drivable for, for emergency vehicles. So matter of managing the public at that point. All right, thank you, Henry and Alvin. Uh, Bill Chapman is my name uh, with the town of Coaldale. And uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, one of my former professors, uh, James, Dr. Tagg, who uh, spoke earlier. And uh, good to see you once again. My question to you is, uh, um, is this, uh, we've received a number of major donations and smaller donations and, and I think some of us have even bought a meter of, of pathway over the years. I know that uh, there's a number of donors even here today that might have bought a, uh, a meter of pathway. Do you, are you still taking donations and could people sign up to uh, pick up a park bench or um, add another meter? Or, um, by a tree or, you know, do you have any ideas as to how we can, we can all participate in, in contributing to this wonderful pathway? Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we do have, uh, we do sell things like park benches and picnic areas. 
And I haven't checked the inventory lately, but uh, we are running out of park benches to sell. We're, I think we've oversold uh, park benches. There's a lot of interest. Uh, so, so it's something that we uh, need to uh, sort out, picnic areas as well. Um, and so it's definitely an ongoing conversation that we're having. Like. Uh, uh, how, how do we acknowledge, you know, further donations and if people want to, uh, uh, you know, honor a, a family member or, or a loved one or, or uh, some significant uh, contribution someone's made. Uh, so we're, we're, having, we're having a sit down with uh, some of us to discuss uh, more uh, how we can acknowledge people more. And there, there's, there's different ways of doing it. But we're always open to, uh, to more uh, input, more donations, certainly, and... Um, just get a hold of us. Our uh, website is linkpathway.org, and my contact, another contact, is there. And these uh, these websites and these contacts are are constantly monitored. Uh, we have our administrative person sitting in the back, and so they they monitor and they respond uh, appropriately. So so it's 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 ongoing for sure, and um, uh, we keep trying to find creative ways of. Uh, of acknowledging more. And our, one of our initial initiatives was to buy a meter of the pathway for $100. And uh, we just thought that was a great way that anyone or almost anyone, everyone could be involved in some small way. And if we'd sell 15 kilometers, uh, 15,000 meters at 100 bucks, I mean, it's a million and a half dollars that we would raise through that initiative alone. And so, and then there would be a, a wall at one of our premier uh, pavilion sites or rest stop sites acknowledging everyone's uh, contribution of of at least very much at least a meter and all the other contributions and that initiative is much like if you remember back in 1988 when Calgary had the Olympics you could buy a brick for whatever it was 10 bucks I think or something I don't even know what it was no more somewhere there wherever that is there's a brick with my name on it too so <laughs> so it, it's just a small way that you can say I, you know I, I was supportive and and I had a small piece in adding to it and so that's the idea behind the buy a meter campaign. And thank you again, everyone, for your interest and for your time this afternoon. Thank you so much. Just, uh, again, reading between the lines, maybe we haven't fully answered the question of the total budget for the path. Three million gets us the total path paved uh, the full distance there. So the million went a really long ways and the other fundraising that we've done. So um, that's that's kind of a, a order of magnitude for you as you're analyzing. We're not we're not waiting for fifteen million for instance. We're 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 well over two thirds there. Uh, sorry. Sorry Alvin, I don't want to disagree with you or have a public spat here, but we and we won't. Uh, the total project cost is $6 million, and we have over $3 million available right now. So we have uh, half of what we need, and uh, the Highway 12, 512 crossing is a big piece of infrastructure. That's our largest piece. Uh, we don't know what the cost is going to be, but it's, uh, it's going to be a significant piece of our, uh, of our project. So, so we have three, uh, around $3 million that we have uh, cash and in-kind, and uh, the total project costs around $6 million. So sorry about that, Alvin. No, thanks for clarifying <laughs> it. Obviously, you've been talking to MP longer than I have, so that's awesome. Thank you. Well, just before we wind up, I just want to tell you next week we uh, address the topic of pronouns and parental rights in schools. So uh, without further ado, let's give uh, the speakers a, a warm welcome and an appreciation of what, they, what they've been up to. It's, uh, like I said, it's been a more than 10 year project and uh, that's apparently what it takes to get good ideas to the, f to the finish line. That's normal to do that for 10 years. No matter how good the idea is, that's, how, that's what it takes. So thanks very much for coming. I hope to see you next week.